If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. But I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the United States. The United States has always been the outlier. It has always been a thorn in the side of Marxists, a kind of societal, national envy, because socialism can't work unless it is global. If I were the devil, said Paul Harvey in a recording from 1965, it was kind of a prophecy, and it's one that has gotten an awful lot of attention in recent weeks. And that's primarily due to the fact that Joe Rogan played it on his show. And it takes a lot to surprise Joe Rogan, but he was, he was very surprised, one might even say shocked, by what Paul Harvey had to say in what has been treated as a kind of prophecy of what the world, America in particular, would look like if things continued in the direction that they were going. Now, Paul Harvey, some of you may not know who he was. Paul Harvey was a, was a guy who for, gosh, I think maybe half a century, had a little radio broadcast for CBS called The Rest of the Story. He had this wonderful, mellifluous voice and he would tell these real folksy kind of stories. Well, this one, which was first an article in 1964, and then he recorded it in 65, and then would make some changes to it down through the decades. This one has received a lot of attention, and it's been treated as a kind of Nostradamus prediction, a prophecy for America. Now, before I comment on it, let's listen to it ourselves. If I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington, and then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing, I'd have judges promoting pornography, Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV 
is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public, and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. So there you have it. Now, first I want to say this. There are many versions of this that are floating around on social media and on YouTube and uh, in written form that are being passed around in email. And some of them feel even more prophetic because they have been, um, shall we say, sharpened as the decades rolled on. They were sort of honed in on what was happening in a specific time. But th this is the 1964 version that, again, was first published as an article by Paul Harvey, and then he recorded in 1965. And even then, this still feels very prophetic. And a lot of people have responded to this with, oh, you know, wow, how could Paul Harvey possibly know that? Well, where I think it offers us insight into today is unfortunately, I think it tells us that we aren't as well educated on these kinds of issues as a previous generation was. Paul Harvey himself, more or less, even is even predicting that. He did educate minds, but let emotions run free. I think schools today, universities, they may be very good from a technical point of view. That is to say, very sophisticated in mathematics, uh, science and technology, but they most definitely ignore the core of education, which is in the molding of the hearts and minds of the soul, if you will. And that comes through the study of history, through the study of um, a philosophy, and through the study of great literature, the, the Western canon. These things are being neglected today, but they weren't neglected in previous generations, hence the reason that they would be familiar with most of the things that are here on this desk and many others, and why they would be very familiar with the concepts that Paul Harvey is talking about. But that's been ignored now. So when people hear something like this, and they are looking back on history the way that Paul Harvey is looking forward in time, their reaction is shock and horror and say, wow, how could he possibly know this? It was, it was fairly obvious. They had seen these things before. This was a movie that they had seen many times before. They had lived through, Paul Harvey had lived through, um, you know, the Russian Revolution and World War I and the 1930s uh, socialist movements and the, the rise of Hitler and the rise of Stalin and the Cold War, they had seen those things. They had seen these kinds of tactics being used in countries all over the world. And they were already seeing them in their own country. So they knew that these are the tactics that are used by the devil, by the communists, by Marxists, by fascists, time and time again. And why? Because they were proven tactics. They were tactics that had toppled regimes all over the world. He's writing in the middle of Vietnam. So he knows, he knows how he would go about attacking the United States as he were the devil. And he's essentially repeating what Antonio Gramsci and Georg Lukash had already said many times before. He was already saying the things that guys like uh, Aldous Huxley and George Orwell had been saying. He would know that. But unfortunately, this kind of stuff is being neglected today. So when you hear that recording, the response is one of bewilderment. How could a guy like this, how could have he have known what the future would look like? It just really wasn't that hard. And I think it tells us that we have a lot of work to do in educating modern generations. You know, in a recent, recent podcast, I said that my generation and the generations before me, Gen X, my generation, uh, the baby boomers, others, failed millennials and Gen Zers. 
uh, by not teaching them these things, by not disciplining them, by not molding their hearts and minds. And I'm, I'm speaking in generalities here. Obviously, there are many good parents and grandparents who did do these things. I think my wife and I certainly did them. And there are many millennials and Gen Zers who are quite astute about the things that we're talking about. I think my, my children fall into that category. But generally speaking, I think there's been a massive failure, uh, a kind of, as I say, conspiracy against those generations. And it has come in part in the form of neglecting them when it comes to these kinds of things. And, uh, and that really matters because without them, without this kind of substantive, I mean, the, the kind of literature that you can sink your, your intellectual teeth into, you lack a lens through which to really see and understand the world. And that means that these days when I engage with many students and I'm talking to them about the things that are happening across the culture, it's obvious that they've not connected any dots. They don't see any connection between open borders, let's say, and the transing of children or a war in Ukraine. And by the way, these things are connected. If Paul Harvey were writing this today, uh, he could make some little tweaks in it that would really make it you know, fit today really well with references to money laundering in Ukraine and turning little boys into little girls and little girls into little boys and um, you know, saying that men can get pregnant and saying that women are just as strong as men and can compete in their sports just as ably as anybody else can do, or that open borders are a, or a good thing, or the non-enforcement of law is a good... He can add all those things. But you see, a lot of people aren't making the connections between them, and there is a connection between them, because all of them are part of a grand demonic strategy, to quote Paul Harvey, to take the ripest fruit from the tree, and that is the United States. And I'll add this, if you read the Communist Manifesto, it's very interesting because the Marxist view was that socialism couldn't work unless it was global. It had to be global, and this was a big a disagreement between Marx and Lenin. Lenin believed it could happen in just one country. And Lenin, uh, excuse me, uh, Marx didn't. Marx believed, no, can't work in just one country. It has to be the whole world. We have to have a global revolution because it's no good if those people who are living in a socialist, Marxist, communist society can look over the backyard fence and can see that their neighbor has a nice three-bedroom house and two cars in the garage and a, a swimming pool and a, his wife isn't toothless. It's no good if they can see that. Everything has to be garbage or nothing because it won't work so long as people living in a socialist society can see that outside of it, life is better. And America has been the beacon of the big billboard against socialism, Marxism, and communism that says that life is better over here. It's why people are coming to the United States and are fleeing countries like Venezuela, Honduras, Chile, Brazil, um, uh, uh, Colombia, all countries that have fallen to Marxists. They're fleeing those countries because those countries are being turned into craters. It's why people are fleeing Africa, why they are fleeing... Uh, parts of Europe where the same kinds of things are taking place because they look at America and they think I can be free there. The government won't uh, tax everything that I make uh, uh, to the point of me living in abject poverty. I have the opportunity to flourish as a human being, to raise a family and to be left alone. These are the kinds of things that Democrats are trying to change. They're all the things that they're trying to destroy. The things that those people were fleeing and coming to the United States, many of them, are the very things that Democrats want to import into the United States. And again, it's because Marx said socialism can't work unless it is global. And the United States has always been the outlier. It has always been a thorn in the side of Marxists because people in the United States 
uh, enjoy a standard of living that no socialist society has ever been able to duplicate. And that leads to a kind of societal, national envy. I read a few years ago an interesting little book by, um, I think his name is Thomas Evans. He wrote a great a biography, in my opinion, um, called Ike's Bluff. It's about Eisenhower. And he tells a wonderful story of Khrushchev flying, I think it's to Geneva, um, for a conference with Eisenhower. And he says that Khrushchev, upon arrival, looking at the Russian-made airliners that they arrived on, he said that Khrushchev told his own people, our planes look like insects next to the sleek, shiny, new, large, modern American aircraft. He said it was an embarrassment. It was an embarrassment for us. And Marx would say, well, the way you solve that isn't by having, you know, big, sleek, shiny, new, modern planes of your own, but making sure that no one has them. So that when you arrive at an airport like that, the crap you're arriving in is no worse than the crap that they arrived in. <laughs> you, you see, this is the way socialists think. This is the way Marxists think. The idea is to make sure that there's no human flourishing anywhere so that there's no contrast between what is good and what is bad. And these are the kinds of things that Paul Harvey is addressing here. And they're the kinds of things that previous generations were very well aware of. You know, it's interesting that I, I grew up in a time when I graduated high school in 1985. We were taught Russian history. We were taught about fascism. We were taught about communism. We were taught that these were very dangerous ideologies, or as I like to say, ideologies, because they're, they're propagated by idiots. And then they must be vigorously opposed. Kids today are not being taught these things. So I don't think we can blame them when they watch something like this and they, they see it as a kind of supernatural prediction of the future. It's nothing of the kind. It's Paul Harvey simply distilling what people were saying in his time and what they all knew. Everyone's gonna encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain and what kind of perspective are we to have on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering. Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do. And undoubtedly, some of them are people who are very near and dear to you. I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand what they're experiencing in the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine. And I want to tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. You can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. I'm going to demonstrate to you how he could know that. Uh, Paul Harvey isn't a Nostradamus. And by the way, Nostradamus, you talk about a guy with a reputation that he doesn't deserve. Nostradamus made such enormous, huge, numerous predictions. He was bound to get something right. But that's not the case with Paul Harvey here. He's simply made one, right? And it feels like he is spot on. Is this because he had, you know, some kind of deal with the devil that would give him some sort of insight or that God above was giving him the insight? Well, 
We'll explain this. And what I've done here is today, I haven't really changed out the books on my table for quite some time, and it was, it was time that I did, but I've just grabbed a few to show you how many other people were saying similar things and how it is that they could possibly know that. Now, first of all, from the, from the devil's side of the argument, those people who are pushing his worldview, we have here Antonio Gramsci. Now, again, these are just books that I pulled from my own library, and there were a few this, this, uh, this morning that I couldn't find that, that I need, and I'll make reference to those too. But here we have Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci was writing in the 1930s. This was a guy who was pushing everything that Paul Harvey is talking about here. This is the long march through the institutions. This is the way to capture a society. It's by attacking, not frontally, uh, the society, that is to say with, um, with, with force of arms, because they knew that wouldn't work in the United States. But Marxists like Gramsci said, no, what we have to do is we have to start in another way. We have to destroy from within those pillars of society that support the whole of America. And those would be the family, uh, the church, the economy. We have to destroy all of those things. And as we do it, government will fall into our hands. So here, again, Antonio Gramsci, he was saying something just like this. Eventually, we'll get around to doing a little book study. I look forward to that, and I really look forward to discussing with the posse, those of you who might sign up to be a part of this book study, this this little short story that was written by Russell Kirk. Russell Kirk was writing in the 40s and 50s, and he is regarded as the father of American conservatism. But this, this little short story is called Ex Tenebris, Ex Tenebris, Out of Darkness. And uh, in it, he is giving a picture of how socialism works and how it seeks to destroy, first and foremost, the human soul. Then we have George Orwell. Animal Farm. Animal Farm. If you read this, I hope you were required to read it in school. I think I think uh, I was required to read it in eighth grade, maybe ninth grade. I can't remember. But uh, I've since revisited it many times. Orwell is, again, saying essentially the same thing that Paul Harvey is saying, especially where Paul Harvey says, you know, up is down and down is up. Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, saying the same thing. Brave New World, again, this is, a, this is a novel written in the 1930s in which Huxley, who was on the left, like Orwell, by the way, an atheist, who was predicting what the world would look like if we didn't stop it. And, and I could add to Orwell, 1984. Uh, many of you have probably have read 1984, but it's a novel version of of what Paul Harvey is talking about. From the Christian side of the argument, we have Richard Wormbrand, Marx and Satan. This is a genius little book. I would encourage any of you to read it. It is about 130 pages. Wormbrand was a Lutheran pastor in Romania. He was arrested by the communist regime and was sent to um, prison where he was tortured for his belief in Jesus Christ. They knew they had to destroy people like Wormbrand and get them to toe the, you know, the communist line. And he talks about in here where they sought to pervert absolutely everything, where they um, required them to take communion of urine and feces. Now, why would they do that? Because it's all about perverting the good things the things of God. It's, we're seeing it in our, our own culture. We're seeing it in, 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 um, in transing children and turning little boys into little girls and little girls into little boys. That's what these people are about. Georg Lukacs. Here is, uh, here is I think he was a Hungarian. He was part of the, um, the Frankfurt School uh, and the Frankfurt School, they, The Destruction of Reason is the name of this book. Um, 
Lukash was a guy who, along with the other members of the Frankfurt School, of which Antonio Gramsci uh, was a kind of part, intellectually speaking, and um, they dedicated themselves to trying to figure out how to destroy, as Paul Harvey says, the ripest fruit of them all, America. And that is because the standard Marxist tactics of seizing a culture, which is with guns, wasn't working in America, and it wasn't working in Britain. So they set about uh, trying to figure out how to do that, and they said what Paul Harvey was saying in this, that the way to do it is to subvert the very fabric of society. So I'm just showing you here, just, just with a few of these books, the way this sort of thing might be done. I'll try to put these titles out so that you can see them and make note of them if you want to. Then over here, I have a few more. C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity touches on the very same things. It makes a very similar kind of predictions and speaking about how you subvert. I mean, among other things, it's not chiefly the, the, um, the purpose of this book, but it is certainly a topic that is addressed. And to this, I will add, I could not find it this morning, screw tape letters, and I'll come back to screw tape letters in a moment, but that certainly is a, another version of what Paul Harvey is talking about. Some of you will know if you follow me on social media, this book, which is fascinating to me, this is written by my favorite novelist, Frederick Forsyth, who is in his 90s now, I believe. I had Sean Davis uh, of the CEO of The Federalist on the podcast recently, and it turned out that Sean uh, Davis and I share a love of Frederick Forsyth. He's no longer writing. He's, he's retired. But this was a book, uh, The Fourth Protocol, which he wrote in the 1980s. It was turned into a mediocre movie. It's hard to turn a, a novel like this uh, into a movie because the intellectual parts of the novel, and it is chiefly that, are reduced to you know car chases and explosions and fist fights and shootouts. And that really isn't what the book is. And it's just unfortunately, when you have to reduce it down to, to two hours, and it's hard, to, it's hard to achieve that. But another thing that fascinates me about this book is that I have four copies of it. I ordered various versions of it, paperback, hardback, the American version, and the British version. Now, the original British version has in it, and that's what this one is. This is the, uh, the British version of the book, first printing. This one has in it almost everything that Paul Harvey is talking about. Now, this was published maybe 20 years after um, Paul Harvey recorded this. But, but what Forsyth is doing is he is laying out the communist plan plot for the takeover of America. And he has, uh, he has a few chapters dedicated to explaining that uh, in some detail. Why that fascinates me is because those chapters are cut out of the American version of the novel. Why is that? Why do they just suddenly get edited and disappear? Because they're all about defunding the police, about purging the military of... Um, the centers of conservative elements um, about uh, the destruction from within uh, of society, of setting criminals loose, of minimizing sentences for crime, and so on. Now, here's another little book by a guy that I had never heard of. His name is John Stormer, and this book is called None Dare Call It Treason. 75 cents, by the way, when this was first published published by Liberty Bell Press in 1964. So about the same time that Paul Harvey was writing and recording this, If I Were the Devil. But see, Stormer here, again, a guy that I've never, I'd never heard of, Stormer was a, what does it say here? He's chairman of the Missouri Federation of Young Republicans and a member of the Republican State Committee 
of Missouri. Now, this is a little book that he wrote warning of the insidious influences of communism in our own culture. One could say that that maybe he's he's um, uh, exaggerating the threat or that he doesn't put enough emphasis on it. But the fact is, he's saying again, essentially the same things that Paul Harvey said. And again, I just put this, I just happened to see this, you know, in an antique store, and it was just in a pile of books. So I I don't know, I paid a dollar for it or something. <clears throat> then we have here COVID nineteen, the great reset by Klaus Schwab. Now, why do I include them? Because those are the guys who are engineering some of the things that we're currently seeing in our culture. They're the ones who are pushing it. And then finally, down here at the very bottom, I have the Bible. And why is that? Because the Bible is where we find the real prophecy of all this. The Bible is where we find the narrative, um, the wisdom, and the um, foundational understanding to cope with these things because it was the Bible that told us where all this was headed. So that's how Paul Harvey would know this. Uh, he was undoubtedly a very well-read man. And again, I'm trying to put the titles out here so that you can see them. And he would be familiar with this. Paul Harvey had a religious impulse. I do not know whether or not he called himself a Christian or not, but he certainly was deeply influenced by a Judeo-Christian worldview. And he was of a generation that had fought communism, that had fought fascism, that had seen these things playing out in real time and had a deep concern for um, what they might have referred to as the Red Scare for the penetration of American culture and government by communism. Now, I keep coming back to communism because really what he's talking about here, the modern day expression of the things that Paul Harvey is talking about, we find in communism. And that brings me to two books that are not on this stack. And for some reason, I could not find them this morning. I, I, I fear that I gave a talk somewhere and I left them. <laughs> um, the first is The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx, published in 1848. Uh, Karl Marx, Karl Marx, and I come back to, to Wormbrand as well. I would strongly encourage you to read this little book, Marx and Satan. Karl Marx was very conscious of the fact that he was employing the methods of the devil. So when Joe Rogan is shocked by what Paul Harvey has to say, I don't think that Paul Harvey saw himself as saying anything that was particularly profound. I think he would assume his audience already more or less kind of knows this because they would be familiar with all of the literature that I'm referring to here, with the exception of maybe maybe a couple of them, and much more. There'd be many other books uh, that they would be aware of. Um, they would be, be familiar with many lectures, many warnings from the highest levels of government in the United States about these very kinds of things. And again, because they would know, <laughs> they would know what the Communist Manifesto was about. In the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx says that we must destroy the family. We must invert every aspect of society and turn people against one another. Now, how are we seeing that today? We're seeing it through something called intersectionality, which is a Marxist idea that atomizes society and turns it into uh, every relationship, whether it's a, um, a corporate, a business relationship, or a family relationship, to turn them all into haves and have-nots. Somebody is in the haves position, somebody is in the have-nots position, and therefore you should be enemies with one another. That was Marxian. That's what, that's what Karl Marx was all about. But his 
ideological heirs have taken it a little further. They have applied a racist element to this. Uh, Gramsci would be proud. Georg Lukash would be very proud. Uh, they've added the racist element so as to say we must turn white people against black people and black people against white people and both of them against Hispanics and vice versa. They've also added a sexual element because the Frankfurt School understood that the easiest way to destroy the fabric of society was through sex and through sex education in schools. And that, of course, is precisely what they are doing. And that leads me to another book that I couldn't find today, the second one that I couldn't, I guess there are three that I couldn't find today, The Communist Manifesto, Screwtape Letters, and then the third is Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. And I guess we could add to that uh, his Reveille for Radicals. But it's Rules for Radicals that essentially systematizes Marxist thought and distills it into an actionable plan. And what does the actionable plan looks like? It looks exactly like what Paul Harvey is talking about here. The inversion of society. And I keep coming back to that because whether or not you believe in the devil, I do, C.S. Lewis did, uh, many intellectuals down through history did. But whether you, whether you believe in him or not, um, he believes in you. And if even if you just see him as a, um, oh, a kind of boogeyman from historic literature, the devil in the Bible, Satan, Lucifer, he's not depicted as um, an original thinker. Rather, he is de always depicted as one who, instead of, instead of um, creating something himself, he simply tries to to destroy the things of God. And, uh, you know, a, a book that I might add here, and again, that I would strongly encourage you to read, even if you just, you just listen to its uh, beautiful poetry, I would argue it's maybe the greatest work of, of um, the English language, and that is uh, Milton's, John Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, Paradise Lost, I'd love to see somebody like Peter Jackson get a hold of it and turn it into a kind of Lord of the Rings, uh, a kind of trilogy. It could be potentially awesome. It's a, an extraordinary uh, a work of fiction, of imagination, but it's one that is based on this book right here. It's based on the Bible. And Milton was a, um, was a genius. And Milton begins his story with, as the Bible tells us, war in heaven. And it's a war in heaven between God and his holy angels against Satan and his demons. And he is driven out, so goes the story. He is cast out and he is cast down to earth with all of his demons. And that, that particular novel, again, Paradise Lost that I'm talking about here, it has this wonderful scene of all the demons meeting in hell and they're they're sitting on these, these stones in council amidst uh, you know, this bubbling lava. And they're in conversation with one another. And they are talking about how they just lost this battle with Jesus Christ and his angels. And they say, what shall we do? What shall we do? What is our plan now? And Satan says, we will set out to take our revenge on him by destroying his creation. He has made man, he has made woman, he has made the universe good and true, and we will pervert it. We will destroy it. We will turn his created beings against him. And that's what's meant by the title, Paradise Lost. It is about the fall of man that's recorded in Genesis chapter 3. Again, an incredible work of imagination. So where what he's talking about here is treated as a, um, 
owe a kind of extraordinary supernatural prophecy, I would say to you that Paul Harvey isn't saying anything here that most of his audience didn't already know. I don't think it's particularly profound. The genius of what Paul Harvey did, and, and in fact, the genius of Paul Harvey, for those of us who are old enough to remember him, he died, I don't know, I think maybe in about the last 10 years. And uh, if you were on a long car ride, you look forward, you know, you, you were excited when you heard his voice come in uh, and say, this is the rest of the story. He would, he would have, you know, something just like this. They're, they're interesting, little insightful five minute broadcasts in the midst of, you know, some other kind of show. The genius of Paul Harvey in this particular broadcast isn't because he was making some kind of extraordinary prediction of the future. The genius was the manner in which he distilled it and the manner in which he delivered it. That was the genius of Paul Harvey. He was so good at doing that. And I want to play another one for you. I don't want to make this, this whole podcast um, just listening to Paul Harvey, although we could do that and it would be worth doing that. But let me illustrate my point by playing for you another one of his very, very famous broadcasts. From now on, I'm quoting an open letter from God. My dear children, and believe me, that is all of you, I consider myself a pretty patient guy. I mean, look at the Grand Canyon. It took millions of years to get it right. And about evolution, boy, nothing is slower than designing that whole Darwinian thing to take place, cell by cell and gene by gene. And I have been patient through your fashions, your civilizations, wars and schemes, and the countless ways that you take me for granted until you get yourselves into big trouble again and again. I want to let you know about some of the things that started ticking me off. First of all, your religious rivalries are driving me up a wall. Enough already. Let's get one thing straight. These are your religions, not mine. I'm the whole enchilada. I'm beyond them all. Every one of your religions claims that there's only one of me, which, by the way, is absolutely true, but in the very next breath, each religion claims that it's my favorite one, and each claims its Bible was written personally by me, and that all of the other Bibles are man-made. Oh, me. How do I ever begin to put a stop to such complicated nonsense? All right. Listen up now. I am your father and mother. And I don't play favorites among my children. Also, I hate to break it to you, but I don't write. My long hand is awful, and I've always been more of a doer anyway. So all of your books, including those Bibles, were written by men and women. They were inspired men and women. They were remarkable people. But they also made mistakes here and there. And I made sure of that so that you would never trust a written word rather than your own living heart. You see, one human being, to me, even a bum on the street, is worth more than all of the holy books in the world. That's just the kind of a guy I am. My spirit is not an historical thing. It's alive right now, right now, as fresh as your next breath. Holy books and religious rites are sacred and powerful, but they are not more so than the least of you. They were only meant to steer you in the right direction, not to keep you arguing with each other, and certainly not to keep you from trusting your own personal connection with me. Which brings me to my next point about your nonsense. You act like I need you and your religions to stick up for me or win souls. For my sake, please don't do me any favors. I can stand quite well on my own, thank you. I don't need you to defend me. I don't need constant credit. I just want you to be good to each other. And another thing, I don't get all worked up over money or politics, so stop dragging my name into your dramas. For example, I swear to me that I never threatened Oral Roberts. I, I never rode in any of Rajneesh's Rolls Royces, and I never told Pat Robertson to run for president. And I have never, ever had a conversation with Jim Baker or Jerry Falwell or Jimmy Swigert. Of course, come Judgment Day, I certainly intend to. Now, the thing is, I want you to stop thinking of religion as some sort of a loyalty pledge to me. The true purpose of your religions is so that you can become more aware of me, not the other way around. Believe me, I know you already. I know what's in each of your hearts. 
And I love you anyway with no strings attached. So lighten up and enjoy me. That's what religion's best for. What you seem to forget is how mysterious I am. You look at the petty differences in your scriptures and you say, Well, if this is the truth, then that can't be. But instead of trying to figure out my paradoxes and unfathomable nature, which, by the way, you never will, why not open your hearts to the simple common threads of every religion? You know what I'm talking about. Play nice with each other. Love and respect everyone. Be kind. Even when life is scary or confusing, take courage and be of good cheer, for I'm always with you. And learn how to be quiet so that you can hear my still, small voice. I don't like to shout. Leave the world a better place by living your life with dignity and gracefulness. For you are my own child. Hold back nothing from life. For the parts of you that can die surely will, and the parts that can't won't. So don't worry. Be happy. I stole that last line from Bobby McFerrin, but who gave it to him in the first place? Simple stuff now. Why do you keep making it so complicated? It's like you're always looking for an excuse to be upset. And I am very tired of your main excuse. Do you think I care whether you call me God or Yahweh or Jehovah, Allah, Wakatonka, Brahma, Father, Mother, even the Void of Nirvana? Do you think I care which of my special children you feel closest to? Jesus, Mary, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, or any of the others? You can call me and my special ones, any name you choose, if only you will go about my business. Now, I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's, I think it's, it's about nine minutes, but you get the idea here. This is a very typical Paul Harvey uh, presentation. And um, the thing that was wonderful about Paul Harvey is that when he was on, I mean, when he was really on and uh, offering you real cultural insight, he was he was terrific. There was almost nobody who could distill in in the language of the common man. He was a, the Jimmy Stewart of uh, broadcasters, the the Nicholas Cage, if you will, of um, of broadcasters. There was nobody better. But then there were things like this where he is terribly wrong. He is way off. First of all, again, he calls it an open letter from God. And he goes on to say that all of the holy books, those were written by man, but not the open letter from God. Well, in this case, the open letter from God, the God of this open letter is Paul Harvey himself, you see. So that's one of the problems. The second problem is what he has to say about religion. It doesn't matter what you call me. It really doesn't matter if you call me Allah or, or um, you know, the Lord or Jesus or whatever it is that you want to call me. I'm all of those things. Well, that's highly problematic. And then he goes on to say, uh, to overlook the petty differences in your scriptures. The differences are more than petty. And then prior to that, he says... Uh, something to the effect of you should you should trust your living heart more than the written word. Now let me let me address each of these. He's played the role of God in this one, and he's played the role of the devil uh, in another one. In this one, I think you can tell. I think Bobby McFerrin's you know very famous song, "Don't Worry, Be Happy." You know, probably came out about eighty six, eighty seven, somewhere in there. So that kind of dates it. And then his references to Pat Robertson running for president. That must have been 88, so maybe that's where we are, somewhere here, 88, 89, mid-late 80s. Uh, his references to Jim Baker and, uh, and so forth all give us an idea of the time in which uh, he was reading this over the air. But the very things he says here, they contradict the holy books that he's talking about. The differences are not petty. I mean, take, for example that the Quran does not hold that Jesus was the Son of God, that he wasn't God made flesh and dwelt among us, but he was rather a prophet. And a prophet, by the way, who didn't even die on the cross. That is the Muslim view. The Christian view says something very different um, regarding that, that Jesus was in fact the Son of God, that he was made flesh uh, to dwell among us. And maybe the most politically incorrect statement in all of Scripture John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, meaning that it's demanding exclusivity, where Paul Harvey would say, I'm in all of these religions. Jesus himself said, no, I'm not. I am not. You can't come to me via Allah. You can't come to me via Krishna or Buddha. You can come to me via me. That's the only way to get to the Father. So it's a demand of exclusivity. And it's a demand of exclusivity that Islam itself makes and also one that Judaism makes. And Judaism doesn't hold that that Jesus was the son of God either. So you see immediately the problem with what Paul Harvey is here saying. When you're trying to blend all religions into a kind of postmodern soup, you end up with nothing because it isn't merely that you're minimizing differences, you're ignoring central, key distinctions between each one of them and what they have to say about God, what they have to say about man, and what they have to say about life. So that's that's pretty important. As for the statement, you know, trust your heart more than the written word, that flies in the face of what Scripture says. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? The scriptural warning is whatever you do, don't trust your heart. But what Paul Harvey is saying here is very appealing to people because it feels it's it's a the the kind of um, you know can't we all just get along sort of thing? Uh, let's just let's just ignore the, the our differences. Let's ignore um, the differences of opinions on politics, on faith, on life. And let's just try to get along. That's completely impossible because there must be some kind of foundation for our societies and for our individual relationships. It's why we have covenants. It's why we have homeowners associations, which I hate, by the way. Um, It's why we have a constitution. It's why we have a declaration of independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Meaning the guys who put that together are stating our unity is found in the belief that there are certain truths that transcend those of governmental laws. And so that even when when the law says that a given thing is legal or illegal, if it is in conflict with the higher law, we must ignore the lower law. You see, you 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 see how that works. And so, but Paul Harvey is saying something here that appeals to a lot of people because it allows them to punt on the real issues, to ignore the real issues. So I play that for you. You can go and find it online. Again, it's called An Open Letter from God by Paul Harvey. And again, the God in this case is Paul Harvey himself, just as the devil in the 1965 broadcast is Paul Harvey too. But Paul Harvey there, more than here, is speaking truth. And he's speaking a truth that would have been well known to that generation, to his generation, and to the society at that time. But I don't know that very many people would have had the talent to put it together, to distill it into something that's four or five minutes long and states it so clearly and in a manner that we could all understand. Now, somebody who did, not in five minutes, but let's say in 250 pages, is C.S. Lewis. Because C.S. Lewis had written, before this, C.S. Lewis had written the Screwtape Letters. If you're not familiar with it, they are the letters of a demon, an uncle, to his nephew, another demon, and he's kind of mentoring him on how to seduce his human prey. And what's the goal? The goal is to make sure that he doesn't become a Christian. The goal is to make sure that he doesn't think on spiritual things, to distract him with with all of the distractions of life. It isn't necessarily to try to get him to think on evil. It's just to make sure he doesn't think on good, and especially to make sure that he doesn't think on the origin, the source of all good, which is Jesus Christ. So it's... It's a, it's a work of imagination, but it's a work of imagination that 
that uh, derives its central principles from the Bible itself. And so the letters, you know, are offering this very clever insight into how a young demon might um, go about seducing uh, those people to whom he is assigned. And once someone becomes a Christian, while that's a setback and a defeat for the demonic realm, it doesn't have to be total. The goal then becomes to make sure that he is an ineffective Christian. The strategy changes a bit, but not much. And that's the screw tape letters. And the screw tape letters might have had in it a chapter like Paul Harvey's If I Were the Devil monologue, uh, because it's very much the same things. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. <laughs>